taking another whooping for the team. It's, it's always good to be in the house of God. We were in the glory land of Auburn seeing our daughter Alicia Friday and Saturday. Um, it is a bunch of cow pastures with a college in the middle of it, and so we get to experience uh, War Eagle. A lot of good stuff going on um, if you are paying attention to the announcements. Some really good stuff coming on. Seek Night is coming up uh, the first Wednesday in November. I'm going to take that night. I'm going to preach on the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So if you have questions on that or you're hungry for more of just the Holy Spirit, we're going to walk through what that actually looks like and what it means in a practical way on Seek Night. Last week, we kind of relaunched the Shoals Dream Center, explained how that ministry has grown and expanded. And I just want to say thank you to all you guys uh, that have, have stepped up to help give and be partners with the Shoals Dream Center. If you did not do that, you can do that uh, simply by texting the word DREAM to 256-670-2860 or just go to the Shoals Dream Center website, shoalsdreamcenter.com. You'll get everything, all the info. And if you go to the website, there's a spot where you can put in your email address and you'll get a monthly newsletter with stories that are coming out of the Shoals Dream Center. And last but not least, we are in group time and I am leading a community group on the Promise Keeper 7 Promises so you know what that is? Promise Keepers, I believe, is a move of God uh, back in the 90s here and all over America. And so tomorrow night, I'm gonna, we're starting back. We took a couple weeks off. I'm going to walk through one of those seven promises at the fire pit. So if you're a guy and you want to come, simply it's about 45 minutes to an hour of worship, prayer, and encouragement. So join us at the fire pit. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to start a, a series. I'm going to focus on the book of Matthew over the next few months for a couple reasons. One, over the past few years, I realized that most Christians in America, especially in the Bible Belt, especially in the Shoals, don't necessarily follow Jesus. We follow Christianity. And if you know that when Jesus saved you, he didn't save you to follow a religion or a former religion or a doctrine. He called you to follow him. And the only way to really follow him is to see what he did, what he does, how he leave, lives, and how he expects us to follow him through his word. And the book of Matthew really lays this out probably better than all the other gospels. So we're going to really walk through uh, the book of Matthew together. But I don't know about you, but we live in a very distracted world. And I think being distracted by everything on our screens and TVs and lives and everything, it's, it's so easy to lose sight of how God is seeking our attention. Now, I live under the firm belief that, that I don't need to try to get God's attention. We don't do worship because we're trying to sing it enough to get God's attention. We don't pray because we're trying to get God's attention, that we already have God's attention. Literally, he sent his son to earth to show us that he's paying attention to our lives. The, the Lord's prayer is saying, listen, he's paying attention to our lives, that God has your, or you have God's attention. The problem isn't on God's side of the equation. The problem is on our side of the equation. You have God's attention, but does God have your attention? Last year, uh, I think right during COVID, we bought a new basketball goal for the house, and I, I was trying to you know, do one of these manhood principles with RJ to make him help me put the, the basketball goal up. So we had to dig this deep hole. There's roots everywhere. We had to get some sackcrete. So I got sackcrete, and I told him, I said, buddy, I need you to get that sackcrete off the back of the truck and bring it over here. He said, Dad, I got it. I'm a man. I said, well, you're 14 and a buck 15. You're not quite a man yet. And he says, I got it. Now, I know, as a man, every young boy hits a stage in life, they have to carry a bag of sackcrete. Every young boy thinks it's going to be lighter than it actually is. So his little, and if you, if you know RJ, he's all legs and arms. There is no torso. This is legs, arms, and a head on top of these arms. And he wanders over to the truck. And he said, Dad, I may need your help. And I said, I thought you were a man. He said, well, I thought I was. So we get the sack creek, we mix the sack creek. We're trying to pour this hole to pour the base for this new basketball goal. And, and we're putting the goal up a couple days later. And the basketball goal, it says it takes three men to put the goal up. And we have one man and RJ. So we're trying to put this heavy goal up, and I'm trying to lean it, and he keeps losing his attention. He's looking over here. He's looking over there. And I'm like, dude, you got to pay attention. Like, this is, takes three men. It's only me and whatever you are. Like, you got to pay attention. And so we're trying to put it up. He loses attention. I said, buddy, you have to pay attention. He said, Dad, I can't. I have HIV. I was like... You got what? 
He said, Dad, I can't, can't pay attention. I get HIV. And I said, buddy, I think you meant ADHD. He said, yeah, that. I said, well, you may want to get those two clarified. <laughs> Later on that day, we went to the PetSmart to get something, and we're trying to get crickets for his lizard. He's looking at the snakes, looking at this. I said, buddy, your ADHD or your HIV, whichever one it is, is cranking up. He said, you're right. I'm going to get focused, Dad. There comes a time in life where you have to get focused. And you have to get focused on the right things. And here's some stats of how addicted to distractions we are. The average American now spends 60 hours on screens per week. The average smartphone user will tap, swipe, or click their smartphone 2,600 times a day, while the top 10% of the users almost 5,500 times a day. One in three mobile phone owners would rather give up sex than their phones. We are on screen for longer than we are asleep. The average person spends eight hours and 41 minutes on electronic devices, which is about 20 minutes more than the average night's sleep. 80% of 18 to 24-year-olds sleep with their phones right next to them. The last thing they see and the first thing they see is a screen. We are distracted. And when you're distracted, whatever is the most important to you seems to be the one thing you don't pay attention to. And when you read the, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3 is all about God trying to get his people's attention once again. He sends Jesus from heaven to earth trying to get them to pay attention to the kingdom of heaven. The book of Matthew is all about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, over and over. And it's almost like Jesus said, listen, pay attention, you're distracted. By the things of life, the materialism, the consumerism, your screens, your sports, your football, your driver's license test, your schooling, you're distracted. But look, this isn't all that there is. There's a kingdom. And he sends John the Baptist to try to get the people's attention. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1 if this screen works. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everybody say repent. You know, that's a, that's a dirty word these days, but it's still used in the Bible. It's like the King James Version. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths Straight, which is interesting. That, that's a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And they're saying that John is fulfilling this prophecy. And, and when you read the Gospels, the, the Gospel of Matthew is written towards Jews. And it's written to try to elevate the prophecies about the Messiah and show how Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. So when you read the book of Matthew, you'll see a lot of Old Testament prophecies prophecies and a lot of Old Testament references. The book of Mark is written more towards Gentiles who are Roman by nature. The book of Luke is written by a doctor. It's more of a biography that's more chronological in order. The book of John is written to unbelievers so they can see the seven signs, the seven I am's of who Jesus is. But the book of Matthew is written towards Jews who thought they were saved to point them to the fact that the Savior was actually there in their midst. And so you'll see a lot of these references. What's interesting though is this prophecy is about John the Baptist being a voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, making the paths of the Lord straight. But now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. There's that, that dirty word again that keeps coming up. But could you imagine you show up to church, and when you walk into church, all of a sudden, some of the, you brood of vipers. Like, that's how John's first impressions and ushers and greeters are welcoming the religious people to his church. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
I baptized with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier, mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Already, the third chapter of Matthew, we have three different baptisms. Water for repentance, Holy Spirit, and fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So before Jesus even starts his ministry, things have to happen. And it almost is almost John the Jesus all throughout the book of Matthew. Before Mary got pregnant, Elizabeth got pregnant. Before Jesus was born, John was born. Before Jesus started preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, John was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Because what happens is there were so many echoes that were going on in culture from the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And an echo is something you kind of hear and you repeat, but it fades away. So the, the Pharisees were just echoing the law. The Sadducees were just echoing the culture around them. And so you had a lot of believers who looked more like legalism and the liberal culture than they did Jesus. And so God was trying to get their attention. So since they didn't listen to the prophets in the Old Testament, they didn't listen to Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Nahum or Malachi or Jonah. Since they didn't listen to the old prophets, he gave them the silent treatment for 400 years. So from Malachi to John the Baptist, there's 400 years of silence. It's like riding in your car with your wife when she's mad at you for 400 years. In those 400 years of silence still did not get their attention. Actually, almost the very last scripture in Malachi refers to the fact God is going to turn his ear from them because they keep chasing the things of the world instead of following God. And so it's almost like God says, if you don't repent, I'm going to give you the silent treatment, so maybe that will get your attention. And then for 400 years they get the silent treatment. Then all of a sudden John the Baptist shows up. And when he shows up, he has one purpose, to prepare the way for the Lord. It's almost like in, in old times they had heralds. Heralds were the guys in the movies that, that before the king comes into a village or a town, they come in and they say, hear ye, hear ye. Prepare, the king is coming to this village in three days. And so all the people would make their preparations. They would clean their porches off. They'd clean the streets. They'd put up decorations. They'd put up banners so that when the king came, he'd be welcomed. So the people would prepare the place. They'd prepare themselves because the king, any time royalty comes, there are preparations that are made before they get there. Any time royalty shows up, there are preparations made before they get there. If Nick Saban was to come to your house, I promise you there'd be preparations made. In 2001, I was stationed at the National Security Agency in Washington, D.C., and is after 9-11. We had tons of people that would come. We had Secretary Rumsfeld. We had Vice President Cheney come. We had senators all the time that be in our office. But then one week, all of a sudden, the whole base changed looks. In a base that was normally pretty quietly, all of a sudden you saw snipers on rooftops. You saw people in all black going through the woods, patrolling the streets and the parks around our base. Because at the end of the week, it wasn't Vice President Cheney, it wasn't Secretary Rumsfeld, it wasn't a congressman. The President George W. Bush was coming. So there are preparations that were made that were special to prepare the way for the president. And so the same way, if you think there's preparations made for President Bush, if you think there's pre preparations made for the Queen of England, if you think there's preparations made for Nick Saban, how much more preparations do you think we made for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? It just doesn't happen. John the Baptist came to prepare the minds, the hearts, and the spirits of the people to get ready because the King is coming. It's like, hear ye, hear ye. This isn't Caesar coming. This is the Messiah. This is the Lord of Lords or the King of Kings. You better get ready and be expecting him because he's coming. See, when Jesus was born, angels heralded his birth. 
we sing the song of Christmas. When Jesus' ministry began, John the Baptist heralded the king was coming. And then at the end of age, it's you and I who are heralds that he's coming back. That there must be preparations made, hearts prepared, lives prepared, churches prepared for the coming of the king. And so John the Baptist, as everybody else is echoing the culture around them, John the Baptist didn't have an echo. He had a voice from heaven. And God is not looking for echoes of culture. There's enough echoes. Our kids echo all the things from culture, from the little slang terms, from all the stuff they say, to all the things they see on TikTok, to the things they see in sports, to all their little interactions. It's echoes of culture. And echoes of culture are designed to influence people to look like culture. But God is not looking for an echo of culture. God is looking for voices of the kingdom to rise up. Before God moves on a people, before God moves an environment, God does not have an echo of the past. God has voices of the future that he rises up to speak what is going to happen in the future. And John the Baptist was that voice. You actually are that voice. See, you need to be a voice of the kingdom rather than an echo of the culture. And that was the whole purpose of John the Baptist to illustrate that exact point. And so John the Baptist was an interesting character. When you say character, he's a real life person. He was a a cousin of Jesus. He was a little bit older than Jesus. And he was living out in the desert preaching a, a street corner preacher repent or go to hell message. But what's interesting was he wasn't preaching in Jerusalem. He wasn't preaching on the street corner. He wasn't preaching at UNA like the guy who comes every year and condemns all the girls who are wearing leggings. He wasn't standing at the corner of the traffic light. He wasn't standing at the mall. He was way out in the wilderness. And people were going out of their way to hear the voice that was telling them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So what's interesting about that is, in America, we refuse to say the word repent, hoping that people will come, and so we have it backwards. We go to where people are and just say, God loves you, God wants to do what's best for you, God wants your best life now. John the Baptist is the opposite of that ministry. Instead of going and telling people, he's standing in the middle of the desert, preaching a message that the kingdom of heaven is near. Get ready, get ready, get ready, as Bishop Jakes would say. And people were coming. You know why people were coming? Because John the Baptist had nothing to benefit from the message he was preaching. You know why they were coming? Because there had been 400 years of silence, and finally somebody was speaking on the behalf of God. You know why they were coming? Because they knew they needed to repent because they have been living with 400 years of living in their own sin. See, sometimes the greatest message is not one of love. Sometimes the greatest message is to get ready because the king is coming. And so John the Baptist is this, you know, weird guy out in the desert wearing a camel jacket with a leather belt preaching repentance and people are coming to him by the hundreds if not thousands. And what I think gave him his power was not necessarily anointing. What gave him his power was maybe this. There is power in knowing who you are and who you are not. See, John didn't try to conform his life or his ministry to what the Sadducees or the Pharisees or what the other prophets had done. John the Baptist wasn't trying to to change who he was to fit in with the crowd. John the Baptist wasn't trying to wear the, the coolest clothes of the day. The cat was wearing camel hair. In the desert. Like John knew who he was and who he wasn't. And I think if there's any message that everyone in this room need to get today, that you will not find contentment in Jesus or the power you're seeking until you know who you are and who you are not. In John chapter 1 it says this. People came to John the Baptist and they said, and this is the testimony of John, where the Jews sent priests to the Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So they're asking John, who are you? 
Like you're out here preaching, like, like you don't preach like us, you don't act like us, you don't talk like us, you're in the wilderness, you're wearing camel hair. Like who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. That's interesting. Because the following he's getting, he's baptizing people, people will follow him. They're actually asking him if he's the Christ. People actually started lifting him up to actually thinking he's the Messiah. But he was quick to say, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, then, what then, are you Elijah? And he said, no, 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 I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. They kept trying to pigeonhole him and keep trying to fit him into a role. And see, that's what culture tries to do, is to fit you into a box. When you go to school, check your box. White, black, Asian, Hispanic, other, whatever the terms are, they change every time I fill in a ballot box. When elections come, they're trying to fit you into a box of how you're going to vote. Well, they're, they're white in the South, they're going to vote this way. They're black in the city, they're going to vote this way. They don't care about you, they just care about your box. And so society and culture is all about squeezing you into a box. And they thought, if we can squeeze John the Baptist into a box, we'll keep his voice confined to that box only. So they ask him, well, are you the Christ? Well, no. Were you Elijah? No. Are you a prophet? No. Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets, even in the Old Testament. And he didn't perform one single miracle. He wasn't Elijah. He didn't see fire fall from heaven. He wasn't Elisha and see all the, the, the jars filled with oil. He didn't see any of the miracles of Noah or, or Moses or Elijah or even Jonah. Not one miracle. You don't see him pray for anybody who is sick and see them healed. You don't see him lift up anybody from the Not one miracle. But they asked Jesus, what about John the Baptist? He said, there is no one like John the Baptist in the kingdom of heaven. It wasn't based off the miracles. It was based on his voice. Because he used his voice to prepare the way for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can only have a voice if you know who you are and who you are not. You can only have a voice if you know who you are and who you are not. Like our kids, most of you guys know that we're a mixed family. So living in the South, it's, it's difficult to try to figure out who our kids are. So we keep trying to define them. You're not black, you're not white. You're who you are. You're RJ, you're Alicia, you're Araya, you're Ariana. You're not defined by cultural statistics and demographic studies. But RJ, last year in basketball, he came home, he started saying the N-word. We're like, bro, we do not say that word in this house. He said, Dad, it's cool. I said, no, it's not cool. You say it again, you're in your ground. He said, no, no, it's cool. I mixed. The kids on the basketball team said I could say it three times a day, and it's cool. I said, no. First of all, 13-year-olds don't get to set the standards for cuss words in our house. Second of all, you are not dark-skinned enough to say that word. You will get broke off if the wrong person hears you. And what he was saying is, I, I don't really know who I am and who I'm not. See, I think a lot of teenagers struggle with, well, I'm trying to figure out who I am and who I'm not. I think a lot of young adults struggle with who I am and who I'm not. I think a lot of adults struggle with who I am and who I am not. So what happens is they tend to identify themselves by, well, I am a pastor or I am a doctor, or I am a nurse, and we begin to identify ourselves by what we do rather than by who we are. And for young people, the battle is if you don't know who you are and who you're not, the Sadducees and the Pharisees of culture will tell you who you are and who you are not. I believe one of the things with the homosexual agenda, which every time I say the word homosexual, no matter if it's good or bad, we get blasted on YouTube. One of the things with the, homo, the homosexual agenda is this. Many of them are not even homosexuals. They just didn't know who they were or who they're not. And the Sadducees and Pharisees of culture convinced them they're somebody they're not. 
And what's sad is we don't have the family unit to reinforce who they are, so culture reinforces who they are not. And so when you don't know who you are and who you're not, you don't have the power of the voice that God has given you and wants you to have. And how do you find your voice? How do you find who you are and who you're not? Well, like John the Baptist, he says, well, I'm not Elijah. I'm not the, Mas- I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Christ. I'm not a prophet. This is my purpose, to cry out in the wilderness, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Prepare the way for the coming Messiah. He found a purpose and served it. See, in our culture, somebody said this, find a purpose and serve it, not a lifestyle and live it. In our culture, the Sadducees and Pharisees will tell you, no, no, find a lifestyle that makes you happy and live it. Find what makes you happy and do it. Just do what makes you happy. Then the kingdom says, no, 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 find a purpose. And when you find the purpose and you serve it, you'll figure out who you are and who you're not. Culture says, no, no, don't find a purpose. Just be happy. And what happens is culture keeps saying, keep just trying to be happy. But everybody is anxious. Everybody's stressed. Everybody's depressed. Everybody's having to take drugs to cover up their anxiety and their depression. Everybody's frustrated. The divorce rate is higher. Families are split up. Life is in chaos. Why? Because we don't know who we are anymore. We're so busy chasing happiness, we don't fulfill a purpose, and your identity comes out of your purpose. See, I think one of the great deceptions of our culture is the fact that culture just says, just do what makes you happy. I don't think there's any other harmful words that destroy a marriage faster than just do what makes you happy. I've seen more divorces based off the whole term of, well, just do what makes you happy. No, you don't get to just do what makes you happy. You're one with somebody else. You have to do what makes y'all happy, which means you do what your wife wants to do. Like culture keeps communicating this. Well, just do what makes you happy. You know what it does? It makes self-centered, narcissistic, emotional people. Your emotions will always lead to selfishness. Emotions never lead to purpose. And so we have a whole culture that just says, I'm going to do what makes me happy. I'm going to do what makes me happy. I'm going to do what makes me happy. But nobody's happy because you don't know who you are. In a, in a secular study, it says this. Happiness is all about satisfying selfish wants and needs. But meaningfulness is about satisfying the wants and needs of others. Happiness involves being focused on the present, meaning right here, right now. But meaningfulness involves more about the past, present, and future and the relationship between them. Meaningfulness is derived from giving to other people, but happiness comes from taking what they give you. See, John the Baptist had this mindset. He was willing to to live in the desert alone and broke and poor because he was content with fulfilling his purpose and content with who he was. Paul said, I've learned to be content in all things. Why? When you know who you are and when you know who you're not, you can be content with whatever life brings you because I'm a man of purpose. And when you're a man of purpose or a woman of purpose, it will help you to live differently than the Sadducees and Pharisees around you. This cat, John the Baptist, is in the desert dressed like Elton John. Like he is confident in himself. He was separated. He's different. Purpose always separates you from culture. Purpose never connects you with culture. Purpose always brings you out of culture and never sends you back in to look like culture. In John the Baptist, you have to learn who you are and who you're not because your power stems from that. And so it gave him the power to preach this message of repent. Can you imagine me if every Sunday I just said, repent, you're going to hell. Repent, you're going to hell. Repent, you're going to hell. If I said that every single week, None of y'all would be here. But John the Baptist, every time he preached it, more people showed up. The reason is because the power behind the message was connected to the messenger. And he said, this is my purpose. 
And I'm a firm believer that every minister, every pastor, every church has their own specific purpose. People make fun of Joel Steen. Joel said some words, things I don't like. But Joel has a purpose. He knows who he is and who he's not. And his purpose is to preach encouragement and to preach faith and to preach consciousness of who you are in Christ to the world. There's other preachers that have other amazing gifts, that have an amazing anointing to preach. This was John the Baptist's anointing. If he preached, live your best life now, they're not going to listen. His message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And repentance is a dirty word most of us don't like to hear, but it means to change your mind and to act on that change. It's the Greek word metanoia, which means repentance, a change of mind, which results in a change of lifestyle or a change in one's mind or purpose. It also could mean to be in, come into agreement with God. So he's out here preaching, say, listen, 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 change your mind and change your lifestyle because the king is coming. He could be saying, return from your rebellion back to God because the king is coming. He could be saying, come into agreement with how God sees you because the king is coming. He could be saying, change what you're doing because the king is coming. That was his message. And he preached it, he preached it, he preached it, he preached it. One person said, repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change in the direction of your life. Prophet Joel said the same thing, but he said it like this, if it's going to work. He says, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will turn and and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So he's saying repent, but here's why he says repent. Joel says repent because God is gracious and has steadfast love towards us. He's merciful. And who knows if maybe he'll leave a blessing behind us as we repent. John the Baptist is saying the same thing. He said, listen, don't rend your garments, rend your heart. Return to God with weeping and fasting. Why? Because Not because he's angry, but because he's coming and he's full of grace and mercy and steadfast love. See, repentance is not a judgment message. It's a salvation message. And many of us grew up in a time in the 60s or 70s where repentance was a dirty word because it was judgment, judgment, judgment. Repent because God hates you. Repent because you're a sinner. Repent because you're going to hell. John the Baptist said, no, no, no. Repent because the gracious, merciful, loving king is coming and he wants all of you to come with him. See, it's not a dirty word. It's a good word. We just let people that are very angry, people rob it. And take it from the heart of God to the heart of anger preachers who didn't, were mad at their church for not showing up on time, so they just preached at them all day. See, repentance is this. There's, there's four stages of repentance. But repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of behavior. You can't have one without the other. So you can repent and change your behavior, but if your heart didn't change, you didn't actually repent. You just became a legalistic Christian. If you repent and you change your mind but not your behavior, you're just a carnal Christian. If you repent and change your heart but not your mind or behavior, you're just a grieved Christian where you're always sorry about your own mess that you got yourself into. It takes a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of behavior. Change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of behavior. Because repentance involves sorrow for sin. Like, you cannot repent... Well, actually feeling sorry to God for the sins you've committed against God. It says in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, it says this, even if I cause you, and this is Paul writing to the church, he says, even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it at the time, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy because you were made sorry. But because your sorrow led you to repentance... For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. For godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. 
What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Paul is saying, listen, I'm sorry that I had to use harsh words. Then he says, well, actually, I'm not. Because I know you felt bad for a little bit, but look what that bad feeling blessed you with. That little bit of sorrow you had led you to salvation that led to earnestness and eagerness, and now it's producing fruit in your life. I think one of the problems with the American church is we're so concerned about people's feelings, we never let them still feel sorrowful for their sins. And when you don't feel sorrowful for your sins, it doesn't lead to repentance, which doesn't lead to forgiveness and salvation. Since we want people to feel good, we rather them feel good in their sin than feel bad in their holiness. And I'm not saying you're going to be a jerk, but I'm saying sometimes, I remember a couple years ago, there was a young man who had a baby. They weren't married. And he came up and he was just like, hey, I just need prayer. You know, we just lost my job and he's in finances, da, da, da. And I said, listen, there's a way that God will bless. But God only blesses his way. He doesn't bless your way. I would encourage you, if you're looking for God's blessing, to come into covenant with him, with your baby mama, bring your new wife and your child under the covenant of God because his blessing is under his way, not your way. But I've been around people who say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll pray for you. You can't pray to cover somebody's sin with, with false humility and just appeasing their emotions. Paul said, I don't want to appease your emotions. I want to appease your spirit. It it involves sorrow. There's a difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse is sorrow for the consequences that affect ourselves and our loved ones. But repentance is sorrow for the effect our actions have on God. Remorse sees our failure through our eyes. Repentance sees our failure through God's eyes. Remorse is self-centered about how it affects me. But repentance is God-centered in how it affects God. See, we need to get back to a place where we see ourselves through the lens of God, not through the lens of our own emotions and our own well-being. I don't repent because I'm upset about my consequences. I repent because I realize the gracious, merciful King saved me from my sin. And if I sin again, it's like me putting it back on the cross to say, the first time wasn't good enough, Jesus. I need you to do that again because I want to live my life however I want to, but I'm upset with the consequences, so I need forgiveness, so just get back up there one more time. No, repentance sees my sin as, I don't want him to go back up there. One time should be enough. See, in our self-centered Christianity, we'd rather crucify Jesus over and over and over again instead of crucifying ourselves and denying ourselves. Repentance also involves confession of sin. When, they were, when John the Baptist was baptizing, he was bringing them out. He would baptize them. They would confess their sins as he was baptizing them. We know later on in the New Testament it says, and it, he is just and faithful to forgive all those who confess their sins. Confession of sin is a part of repentance. And repentance, one person said, is the ultimate honesty. Repentance is the ultimate honesty. It's where you get honest with yourself. And you get honest with God. And I would tell you that the more detailed you confess your sin to Jesus, the more forgiven you actually feel. But when you just say, well, Jesus, just forgive me my sin. I'm, I'm sure I sinned today. I'm, uh, you know, I only give my life to Jesus. I, I'm just a sinner. I just, no, no, no. See, I believe people deal with unforgiveness because they only generalize their sin to Jesus. I think the more for- detailed you become, the more forgiven you feel. And I'll I'll tell you this way. I think one of the cultures I wish we had, I wish we had an authentic culture where people would put away their religion, put away their traditions, put away their church clothes, and they'd just be real, authentic followers of Jesus. But to get there, you have to come to this understanding that it's better to be raw and broken than to be fake and broken. And to come to a place where you realize either you can cover your sin or Jesus can cover your sin, but both of you can't. And the only way he can cover my sin is for me to confess my sins to him from the cover in his blood. But if I keep covering my sins, his blood can't touch it. So confession of sin, repentance involves turning from sin. Meaning I can't be sorry for my sin and keep staying in my sin. 
Could you imagine Jesus on the cross, you're the prodigal son of the pigsty, and you say, I need forgiveness. He says, okay, and you stay in the pigsty. No, repentance means a change of action. You have to turn. You have to turn from yourself to Jesus. I thought the whole prodigal story of the son and the father. The prodigal son gets all his inheritance. He wastes his inheritance. He's living in a pigsty, eating out of the pig stuff. He's, he's eating junk that the pigs are left over. He has this thought come to his mind. Man, my father's servants eat better than this. So he started to change his mind that this is not what God has for me. And it wasn't because God was going to judge him. It was because my God is a good God. He said, my father's a good father. Even my servants eat better than this. So maybe if I just go back home, he'll let me be a servant. So he's having a change of mind. Then he has a change of heart. He's saying, well, maybe if I just go back home, I can be a servant. So he has a change of heart, which leads to a change of direction. So repentance doesn't just mean stop doing. It means returning back to where you came from. So then he starts walking down the road to go back to the father's house just to be a servant. But what he did not realize was that the father was not looking for a servant to come home. He was not looking for a bond slave to come home. He was not looking for a foot washer to come. He was not looking for a brick mason to come home. He was not looking for some broken down judge heathen to come home. He was looking for a son to come home. See, when you repent, you're not repenting from something. You're repenting to something. See, repentance is about leaving something for something better. It's the reason you repent. It's because he said, salvation is here and judgment is near. The kingdom of heaven is close and it's coming, which doesn't mean judgment. It means salvation is coming. So we have to change our language from repenting from to repenting back into the arms of a gracious, merciful, loving Father, I've been gone for way too long. My heart hurts, my back hurts, my body hurts, my head hurts, my life hurts. But there's a God who will hold me in his arms and protect me and carry me through this life all the way to heaven. Which leads to a change of behavior. I promise you the prodigal son, when he went back to the father's house, he didn't live like he was in the pigsty. He lived like he's in the father's house. Change of mind leads to a change of heart, leads to a change of direction. I think the reason John the Baptist could preach this message with such boldness, such power, because he wasn't preaching judgment. He was preaching the heart of the father to get ready The Father is coming to get you. Get ready. The Father is coming home. Get ready. He's merciful. He's gracious with steadfast love. You've got to change your mind. Your sin is not worth it. You've got to change your heart. To love Him more than you love the stuff, then you've got to Turn another direction. It's like when you get lost in the highway. If you keep going the same direction, you're only going to get farther away. But when you turn around, you start going back in the right direction. If you would, I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a minute. John the Baptist is this peculiar prophet. Cousin of Jesus. Prophet after 400 years of silence out in the wilderness, dressed in camel hair, wearing a leather belt, just with one message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. What's interesting, when Jesus starts his ministry, the very first message he preaches is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The primary message of Jesus was the same message as John the Baptist, which is the same message I'm preaching to you today to repent, to change your mind. Let that change your heart. Let that change your direction to start returning back to the perfect will of the Father. Why do we not repent? Just like the Sadducees, Pharisees, maybe we're we're depending on our family tradition. 
They depended on Abraham and their bloodline. Maybe you depend on your mama, your grandmama, your daddy. Somebody was a deacon or maybe they were a member of some church. Maybe they're a pastor or a preacher. Maybe you're depending on that bloodline. He says, no, 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 no. He called them a brood of vipers. Even these stones could produce children of Abraham. Maybe you're depending on yourself just to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and your efforts. The Pharisees, they tried everything they could to save themselves. They did the law to the nth ninth degree. Called them a brood of vipers. Maybe you just relying on your, your own confidence, your own reputation. I'm a good person. Sadducees are great people. He said, You brood of vipers. But yet, so many other people who were sinners, who were broken, who were heathens, were coming. John the Baptist didn't tell them, call them a brood of vipers. He said, Come on, I want to baptize you for the repentance of sins. For heaven is coming near. That's you this morning. This is just a, one of my prayers the last year has just been for, for a move of the Holy Spirit that produces just a move of repentance and holiness. I'm just praying, not just in this room, I'm just praying for churches, I'm praying for a country, I'm praying for the capital C church across the world, just for a move of repentance to change our We're so much like the Sadducees and Pharisees, it's heartbreaking. We have so many echoes of culture. We have so many echoes of identity. We have so many echoes of purpose. We need a voice that just cries out in the wilderness. Make clear the path of the Lord. That's right now, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you said today is the day you want, to, you want to change your mind, you need to change a direction in your life. You need to move from the direction you've been going to the direction God is going. And the only way to do that is to repent. You have to change how you think about it. You got to change your heart. You got to love God more than you love your stuff and just change your direction. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to have you come forward. This is a private moment between you and God. He said, you know what? I've, I've asked for forgiveness. We're not even talking about forgiveness. We're talking about repentance right now. Forgiveness is the byproduct of repentance. We're talking about changing the direction you're going from running towards your desires to running towards God's desires. That's you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Not going to have you stand up. Not going to have you come forward. That's you. I just want you to just slip a little hand up just so I can see. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. All over the room. Thank you. You put them down. I'm going to pray in just a minute just for the Holy Spirit to flood your heart. But after service, you would just do me a favor. Just slip into the connection. Connect center out in the lobby. Just let them give you a resource. I want to call you and just follow up with you and encourage you this week. Father, we thank you so much for your spirit. We thank you that you are a gracious, merciful God with steadfast love. Father, you're not looking for, heart, for garments that are rendered. You're looking for hearts that are surrendered. And right now, Father, we just ask you to give us a new mind to change the way we think about sin, the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about you. Change our hearts to have a desire and passion and burning for you more than a burning for all the stuff around us. And Father, set our feet towards your will and let your Holy Spirit be the wind at our back to drive us and compel us and propel us towards your perfect will and destiny for our lives. Father, for everybody else in the room, I just pray right now that you help them know who they are and who they are not. I pray you help them find a purpose to serve instead of chasing after our lifestyle or chasing after happiness or chasing after desires or chasing after anything else. Father, help them find out who they are and who they are not in you. I pray when they go to bed at night, you speak to who they are in their minds. When they wake up, the first thing they hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. They start hearing the words of affirmation from your Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Uh, the elders are going to come up. If we can have our prayer team come down front, we're going to need prayer for anything.